with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Monday, July 18th, 2022. My name is Emma Vigeland, in for Sam Cedar, and this is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Oliver Below, author of Butler to the World, How Britain Became the Servant of Tycoons, Tax Dodgers, Kleptocrats, and Criminals. Meanwhile, a special Texas House Committee report found that nearly 400 officers were at Robb Elementary in Uvalde on the day of the massacre concluding that the cops could have taken charge and done something earlier in that 77-minute gap. Counterpoint, what if there were 401 officers there? Maybe that would make a difference? There was also another mass shooting over the weekend in Indiana. Three were killed, plus the gunman. Joe Biden said on the campaign trail that he would make Saudi Arabia a pariah on the global stage after the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Smash cut to him fist bumping MBS on his visit to the country on Friday. Rand Paul has saved Biden from himself because Paul has said that he won't return the blue slip consenting to the nomination of Chad Meredith, the anti-abortion Federalist Society guy, Biden was nominating to a lifetime appointment for peanuts from McConnell. The White House has abandoned these plans, thankfully. A Trump appointed judge has temporarily blocked two federal agencies from enacting LGBTQ workplace protections in 20 states, arguing that they infringe on states' rights. Speaking of that guy, Trump, Rolling Stone is reporting that Trump wants to run in 2024 for many reasons, but mostly because he wants that juicy presidential immunity, I say that in quotes, to avoid jail. So now maybe he can appoint the most loyal attorney general possible. I wonder what Jeff Sessions is up to. And lastly, the text messages deleted by Secret Service agents between January 5th and January 6th of 2021 are the subject of the Jan 6th committee subpoena and will be reportedly reaching the committee by the end by this week as early as Tuesday. Very interesting. And by the way, good job to The Intercept and Ken Klippenstein for reporting on that. All this and more on today's program. Welcome to the show, ladies and gentlemen. I know Sam should be here. He's supposed to be here on Monday, but um, he had something to deal with, with his son, Saul, with his kid, bit of a, a emergency that you don't have to worry about situation. He just had to, to uh, take today off to deal with that. So everyone's okay, but I'm filling in um, and we will be getting into the news to kick off this week for you. A lot happened on Friday. Um, I didn't really headline Joe Manchin there because I knew we were going to flesh this out now. But for people that may not remember or, you know, have tried to scrub this from their memory over the weekend, Joe Manchin once again killed the Biden administration's latest iteration of Build Back Better. But it's not even that anymore. It's a reconciliation climate package that they were trying to uh, to, to to come to an agreement on. A reminder that Joe Manchin is a coal millionaire. He takes the most money, I believe, of any senator from fossil fuel companies. He, in his own, it is in his own financial interests, 
literally directly that climate change is not addressed. So what a shocker. He was not interested in uh, addressing climate change via electric vehicle funds, uh, clean air protections. Some of the things that were being discussed and um, fleshed out in this reconciliation negotiation process. But this news broke on Friday. So afterwards, he goes on West Virginia radio and he basically says that he's be, he'd be open to looking at this again after the July inflation numbers come out. This is just another excuse on his list. My dog ate my homework. Uh, my cat peed on my homework. Um, I got into some sort of accident on my bike. Like every time, every <laughs> excuse that a kid has uh, used to get out of their homework assignment in class, Joe Manchin has used that 40 different times. And inflation is his, diff is his uh, you know, latest uh, hobby horse on that front. So he went on West Virginia local uh, radio and said, that he doesn't want any uh, ta new taxes to address this, even though he also says the bill can't cost anything. So I don't. Th th there's there's really no way to square that if you're looking at it in Joe Manchin's terms. No taxes on wealthy people. No taxes on corporations. But also, uh, this can contribute to the deficit, and you're, there's no way for you to raise money to actually fund these programs. So like he is constantly. It's it's Lucy with the football and the Biden administration keeps trying to kick the football and they keep treating him like he is a good faith negotiator. So but frankly, Bernie Sanders is not having that. He had a bit of a uh, I, I would say an impatient moment, but cathartically so when he was on uh, cable over the weekend with Mar Martha Raddatz uh, on ABC she asks him about Joe Manchin pulling out of negotiations for the uh, reconciliation package that would include climate change provisions. And uh, he was not really having the framing of this of this question. And the and the agenda there, Senator Joe Manchin, of course, abruptly pulled the plug this week on the Democrats. No, Martha, plans he didn't to abruptly. Pass Martha, oh, oh, okay, Martha, let, 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 okay. he abruptly on Friday. He didn't did abruptly that. do anything. He was he has sabotaged for a while. the president's agenda. No. Uh, look, if you check the record six months ago, I made it clear that you have people like Manchin, Cinema, Cinema to a lesser degree, who are intentionally sabotaging the president's agenda, what the American people want, what a majority of us in the Democratic caucus want. Nothing new about this. And the problem was that we continue to talk to Manchin like he was serious. He was not. This is a guy who is a major recipient of fossil fuel money, a guy who has received campaign contributions from 25 Republican billionaires. You okay, think this guy is serious? Senator, I no. want, I, uh, okay, you say he wasn't serious, but Manchin says his main goal is to do what's good for West Virginia, <laughs> and he's worried about inflation. Listen to what he told the really, West Virginia really? radio station. Listen to this, please. Is that <laughs> is absolutely killing many, many people. They can't buy gasoline. They have a hard time buying groceries. Everything they buy and consume for their daily lives is a hardship to them. Your reaction to that, Senator? Well, look, the same nonsense the mansion has been talking about for a year. West Virginia, it's a beautiful state. I've had the pleasure of being there. Great people. It is one of the poorest states in this country. You ask the people of West Virginia whether they want to expand Medicare to cover dental, hearing, and eyeglasses. You ask the people of West Virginia whether we should demand that the wealthiest people in large corporations start paying their fair share of taxes. Ask the people of West Virginia whether or not all people should have health care as a human right like in every other country on earth. That's what they will say. In my humble opinion, you know, Manchin represents the very wealthiest people in this country, not working families in West Virginia or America. And, and, and Senator Sanders, I, I want to end with, if these provisions don't get passed, doesn't yeah, look that... like they will, what does that mean for Democrats' climate goals and the climate itself? Martha, it ain't Democrats. It isn't the president. It is the future of the planet. So, when... Right. Um, and uh, she goes on to the, the, the basically the... I, the mainstream press feels the need to constantly, you know, present 
Joe Manchin's position as if it is in one in good faith. And, you know, the New York Times had a write up of this where they in the top of the article uh, mentioned his corruption, essentially, and the fact that he is directly profiting off inaction on climate change, which is good. Uh, ABC didn't get the memo that it's, it's now it's it's acceptable to call a spade a spade. You don't have to carry water for Manchin's position on this. I mean, especially if and I, Bernie's frustration was hilarious. Oh, really? As he's as like they they paper over uh, his statements with the clip. Uh, but but, you know, you don't you don't have to present that position as if it's in good faith, especially when we have his track record, Joe Manchin's track record of I'm open to negotiation, except just kidding. I have this arbitrary number that I've already negotiated with Chuck Schumer on 1.75 trillion. And I'm not going to go over that. Oh, we've, we've reached that number. We have reached that number, Joe Manchin. Just kidding. I'm not interested in it, in it anyway. Um, so without all of that history and context, a viewer who's just tuning in to ABC on Sunday will think it's a good faith debate between those two sides. And that's obviously not the case. And Manchin has still yet to present an argument that inflation would be affected in any way, in any way, by a standard small package addressing climate change with some incentives for electric vehicles. There's actually zero logical connection between those things. And yet he still repeats this same point all the time um because he really has no other argument manchin loves this he loves killing every part of the biden agenda and then coming out publicly to say hey but i'm reasonable i'm open to negotiating until he kills it again because that is his brand it's centering himself in these negotiations it's making himself a headline in a red state where he can say, I am the last ga- I am the last uh, soldier against wasteful government spending, etc. And the Biden administration has essentially taken an entirely hands-off approach to selling their agenda and combating these paper-thin talking points of, nego- of, of inflation and of uh, government spending. It's really easy, as Bernie mentioned there, to sell this agenda to the public if you are actually engaged in doing so. And just another reminder that progressives were right the entire time. We were right on this program. Pretty much every progressive show, every progressive uh, lawmaker in this country was right on the decoupling and passing of bipartisan infrastructure. We lost all of our leverage to do anything substantial for the American public because of these nonsense calls for, I want to win ahead of the midterms, even though this is a year in advance, and uh, I we need, we need bipartisan infrastructure. We need it now, 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 now. And the moderate centrist Democrats were pushing, pushing, pushing. And frankly... A great majority of the progressive caucus caved under the pressure, with the exception of people like Ilhan Omar, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, Cory Bush, etc. So there were a select few who understood that this would be giving into exactly what Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema wanted. They wanted this bipartisan infrastructure bill. That was what you could hang over their head. And, and they said, oh, well, but we'll still negotiate on Build Back Better. Don't you worry. Take our word for it as, once again... We stab you in the back. Like, learn something from this. And yet, uh, I can't wait for the next time there's some sort of negotiation process and progressives are once again blamed for something failing, even though it's like very hard, I understand, for the press to stomach this, but it was directly the centrist corporate wing, center right, if we're being real corporate wing of the Democratic Party that is responsible for these negotiations falling apart, and the evidence continues to mount. Um, So, yeah, I share Bernie Sanders' anger. Yeah, and just a quick aside there, the only people who, if this bill was even going to make it to the House, you know the person who was spearheading the opposition to it on the Democratic side? Josh Gottheimer, Gottheimer. because he wanted to restore the SALT tax provision. Mm -hmm. So I don't see any 
coordinated opposition yet from the progressive caucus, but for this pared down, slimmed down re- reconciliation bill that's also probably not even going to come to the House. But who is lining up with all their ducks in a row? <laughs> Who's Josh Gottheimer to say we're not going to pass it unless we get a, you know, upper class tax tax cut in New Jersey? <laughs> Literally his only, it, it seems to be that's his only issue that uh, he's a single issue voter, as they say, <laughs> honestly. Um, yeah, Manchin says that they're, they're going to be back to the table to negotiate uh, Medicare drug prices and uh, an Obamacare two years subsidizing until he does the same thing on that as well. With that said, folks, we're going to take a quick break. But first, we have a bit of a message, not a bit, a message, one message from one of our favorite sponsors. The hot summer months are here. Don't I know it? hot as hell in the studio and we need to be proactive about keeping our bodies fueled and hydrated one stick of liquid iv and 16 ounces of water hydrates you two times faster and more effectively than water alone plus liquid iv products taste great with 10 refreshing flavors that really sound like summer from lemon lime to concord grape to tropical punch to acai which is my favorite and yesterday i had some watermelon i went to a wedding on saturday night I decided, hey, I got to recover on Sunday. It's hot. You know, I'm feeling a little not my best. And Liquid IV is really my go-to to to feeling better um, after a night where, you know, you might, might have had a few drinks. Liquid IV contains five essential vitamins, B3, B5, B6, B12, and vitamin C. With Liquid IV, you get three times the electrolytes of traditional sports drinks. It's made with premium ingredients and is non-GMO and free from gluten, dairy, and soy. The science of cellular transport technology is what makes liquid IV so effective. It's designed to enhance rapid absorption of water and other key ingredients into the bloodstream. Liquid IV is on a mission to change the world. The company has donated over 24 million servings globally. Now, uh, again, I love the watermelon flavor. I like the strawberry flavor. I like the guava flavor. I like the acai. That's what I go for. Um, But sometimes I'll dip my toe into lemon lime. We all know that Sam secretly likes pina colada not so secretly um and the uh what's the one that he likes the matcha he loves that matcha flavor and, and recently tangerine as tangerine well. yes his new, his new kid we yeah. really don't have overlap honestly so that's like that's helpful for the office because i can take home the flavors he doesn't have and uh he'll have the flavors that i do grab your liquid iv uh, or that i don't rather Grab the liquid I- your liquid IV in bulk nationwide at Costco, or you can get 25% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use the code majority rep, majority rep, short for report, at checkout. That's 25% off anything you order when you shop Better Hydration today using promo co- code majority rep at liquidiv.com. All right, folks, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we will be joined by Oliver Below.
We are back, and we are joined now by Oliver Below, author of Butler to the World, How Britain Became the Servant of Tycoons, Tax Dodgers, Kleptocrats, and Criminals. Oliver, thanks so much for being here today. Thanks for inviting me on. I I'm looking forward to our conversation. Um, so your, your book is really essentially about the UK enabling financial crime. And, you know... Uh, I feel that in, um, particularly in the context of uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we hear all about like oligarchs or we'll hear about corruption in uh, different countries, say African countries and how corrupt this country is, et cetera. But there really doesn't seem to be a ton of awareness or consciousness about where this corruption is uh, engendered and where it's allowed. And your book sheds a light on that. So um, it really starts at the top. And the UK is a, is, is a place um, where the, 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 that is, you know, uh, fostered. So can you talk a bit about uh, the genesis of your idea? Yeah, so I'm a, a Russianist, a Russophile. Um, I moved to Russia uh, in my uh, very early 20s, uh, just because I'd always been fascinated by Russia and Eastern Europe. Um, and I, I decided when I finished university that I'd just move and live in Russia and work there and try and find a job. And, and I became a journalist uh, writing about, you know, day-to-day -day events. And I suppose I'd had this kind of rather naive idea that what I'd be writing about would be the development of democracy. You know, it obviously, you know, Russia had been an authoritarian country forever. And yet in the 1990s, for the first time, it had sort of proper elections and proper media and kind of independent business people and all that. And it was it was exciting. And um, obviously, you know, spoiler, uh, I didn't end up writing about the development of democracy. Just um, it must have been three weeks or so before I arrived. Vladimir Putin became prime minister and he's been, you know, prime minister or president ever since. And gradually um, at first, but increasingly quickly, I suppose, in the last few months, He's been stifling any kind of sign of, you know, civil society or freedom or democracy, um, you know, ruthlessly. Uh, so I ended up obviously writing about that because that was what was going on. Um, but it's very difficult to I'm in Russia or, or any other country in the former Soviet Union without coming across corruption. Uh, you get shaken down on the street by police officers or coming to the airport by customs officers or whoever. It's a fact of life. Um, and it became increasingly clear to me that corruption was more than just a kind of street level thing. It was a phenomenon that, that really encompassed the whole state. You know, the state had been transformed into this attractive machine to take money from its own citizens. And that, you know, Putin essentially sits at the top of this pyramid of, of theft that's just taking away everything. And the, this very small group of all basically men around Putin have become incredibly wealthy. You know, the inequality in Russia is 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 really off the charts um so you know that struck me after many years writing about russia in the form of some the most important thing that was happening the fact that the government though they posed as these kind of nationalists and essentially transformed the state into a looting machine um and you don't need to start looking at that very long realizing that they didn't do this on their own right because where does the money end up well the money ends up being spent on super yachts and mansions uh you know football clubs uh, you know, the general bling of the international super rich. Um, and so, you know, I wrote a book about that called Moneyland, which was about this sort of global kleptocracy machine. But it struck me that there was this aspect of this phenomenon that I hadn't properly explored in Moneyland, which is the fact that whatever the scam or whatever the scheme, there is always, but always a British angle. It might be a shell company is British, which is you know, the biggest ever money laundering sc scandal with $230 billion moved by Danske Bank, its Estonian branch, mostly hidden behind British shell companies. It might be a British lawyer, you know, arranging uh, business affairs for an oligarch. It might be a mansion which has been sold to an oligarch where he, he lives or, or keeps his mistress. It might be a British school that's getting his children. It might be a British politician that's serving on the board or chairing the board of his company. Whatever it is, there's an oligarch. Somewhere there's a Brit. Um, and... That phenomenon struck me as sufficiently appalling from a British perspective, so sufficiently kind of interesting from a global of how the global criminal economy works, that it struck me as worth writing a book about. And um, and it turned out to be a far more interesting 
are given it credit for. Um, you know, this this goes back further than I thought it did, and and really it is one of the keys standing how uh, ruling classes of places like Nigeria or Russia, Azerbaijan, China, you know, uh, Argentina have really been able to for so long been able to their countries with total impunity and steal this unbelievable sums of cash and stash it offshore and then spend it in property because they've had so much help and primarily they've had help from people in this London in the UK. And, and I mean, you mentioned uh, Russia and like kind of this economy of corruption that has been uh, created in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union. I mean, part of that has to be too just shock doctrine capitalist politics, right, where essentially uh, the dominant players of the United States, and maybe you could include Britain in this, I'm not sure what your research found here, um, saw an opportunity to westernize uh, uh, Russia to a degree, bring in a lot of capitalist um, industry, and it was the shock doctrine, as Naomi Klein puts it. Um, do, do, would you see that as... Uh, a, a common a commonality in Russia and other countries that they're deemed as corrupt are um, Western influence that has created that kind of corrupt economy. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the sort of Jeffrey Sachs and sort of the U.S. advisor who helped create the Russian economic model get a lot of criticism, not least from Naomi Klein in the Shock Doctrine, which you know is, remains. I read it, reread it recently. It remains an amazingly compelling book. But you know, they had. Uh, only were they were only able to do that because there was a, a, a cadre of Russians within government in the early 1990s who who really wanted to transform their economy, and they had a plan. You know, it was a you could argue about whether it was a a, a, a fair plan, but it was a coherent plan to try and break the back of communism. The idea being that that if they property out the door as they could uh, by just privatizing everything quickly. You know, the privatization auctions might be unfair, they might be whatever, but if they could get the property out the door, that would create a property-owning class. Once you have a property-owning class, they're going to demand free and fair court proceedings to defend their property. If there are going to be free and fair court proceedings, they're going to demand influence over lawmaking process. And then you end up essentially with democracy, the, the logic being that private property is going to be the fixed point from which you destroy the, the authoritarian state and build democracy. Now, you know, it may or may not have been a good plan, but it was a plan. The problem with what Britain and the other offshore centres did is they allowed the oligarchs who were created in that first privatisation progress to essentially short circuit the entire step by step nature of that mm. plan because they got the property, they took it outside Russia, they invested it in London, and they've gone all the way around to the end. They've got the rule of law in London, they've got democracy. In London, they don't need to build that at home. They don't need to go through the messy, annoying, boring process of building democracy and the rule of law because we sold it to them. So essentially what you ended up with because of the role of London, particularly London, I mean, Switzerland, the US, some other places had a go, but London was really the, the driver when it came to accepting Russian wealth. Is What it did is it allowed the oligarchs who'd, who'd, who'd got this money, these rigged privatization all to, to sidestep the entire Russian political legal process, to put their money in London and then use, essentially to become cause of their own nation because they use their offshore power and offshore to, to predate on people in their own, because they didn't care anymore about the courts. They didn't care if the courts were fair or not because they were just using them as weapons against other people. They weren't themselves because their wealth was outside the country. They didn't care about the the, the fairness of the process that was because they weren't subject to Russian laws. They had elsewhere they didn't care about the fact that the the roads were collapsing the schools were collapsing the hospitals were collapsing they had you know their children were being educated abroad they went to hospitals abroad and so on so essentially by providing these offshore to the arcs um it, it allowed them to become the military colonizers of russia which created this particularly nasty form of clemency that you get in russia now so obviously you know sort of advisors the U.S. advisors to those early Russian politicians do share an aspect of the blame for having helped create this system. But really, it's the fact that the people, the first beneficiaries of this privatization program, were able to immediately opt out of any kind of um, Russian process thereafter is what really doomed Russia. 
And that phenomenon, though it wasn't exactly the same in the other countries of the former Soviet Union, but you get broadly similar, the same dynamic, because as soon as someone has got a fortune, they can take it out of the country and, and then just essentially enjoy it overseas. They go all the way to, you know, like they're playing Slex and Nadas, they can go all the way to 100 with their first role. And we see exactly the same process in, in the, um, the former colonies of, of say, Africa or, or, or Southeast Asia, you know, Nigeria, Again, the ruling elite was able to take the money out in exactly the same way that the British used to do to Nigeria. They extracted the wealth. The new post-independence ruling elite did the same thing. They extracted the wealth and they brought it, ironically enough, to the same places where the British used to take it, they took it to London. So you ended up with essentially the, the kind of plumbing of the British Empire uh, being repurposed, not for British people to extract wealth from all over the world, but for other people to extract wealth. But from a British perspective, it, it didn't really care. We didn't really care who the money belonged to, because if it came here, we could earn fees from moving it around. So, I mean, that's essentially the role London has played as this kind of um, offshore playground for anyone with money to come to. And the great difference, uh, you know, wondering what, what's the difference? What, what's London got that, that, that New York doesn't have? Um, it's more like what does New York have that London doesn't have, which is that New York has got the FBI. So, so if you put money in the US, there there is a and not inconsiderable chance if you are, you know, egregiously corrupt that you will be investigated and prosecuted. That that doesn't happen here. Um, you know, we have a vanishingly small chance you commit a crime that you will be noticed or noticed you will be investigated or prosecuted. Even if you are, the chances are the case will fall apart. So it's a it's a playground really for anyone with wealth. Your money is safe. It's protected by British courts, the British authorities, and it's never really going to be investigated. So who wouldn't want to bring their money here? It is a fascinating dynamic. I want to go back a little bit in history to the uh, uh, the, the British Empire kind of reinventing itself post World War II. Um, you talk about the Suez Crisis in your book as this defining moment as well, where the Egyptian people had the gall to uh, want to have control over the canal that runs yeah. through its country. How, and that, how dare they, right? How dare they? And <laughs> yeah. that's that was perceived as you know the really the death uh, knell. Uh, for the uh, for the British Empire, and so now you have to come up with a new way to be central to the movement and and production of capital. So this was really their new, um, you know, new empire, new me kind of uh, 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 makeover. Um, so can you talk about how that came to be and, and, and what were some of the historical dynamics at play in the mid 20th century that led to this? Yeah, I mean, if you talk to some British historians today, you get the idea the British Empire was a kind of a sort of combination between a sort of Christian missionary organization and a railway company, you know, going around the world, building trains and open schools for foreigners. But obviously, it was a ruthless machine for extracting wealth from all over the world, bringing it back to Britain. That's why it existed. It was a, a gigantic wealth extracting machine. Um, but gradually, because of the two world wars, Britain was essentially bankrupt. Um, and because of the pressure put on Britain from primarily the United States, but also other places to divest itself of its colonies to allow them to be free, you know, by the 1950s, Britain ended up with significantly smaller uh, role in the world than it had previously. Obviously, it was broke and was no longer the great world power that it had been. Um, so what did it have left? You know, it's looking around, you know, the cupboard and the cupboard is looking rather bare. Um, what it did have was the city of London, this great, what had been the great financial engine of the British Empire. It still had all the connections all over the world, though they weren't being used anymore because, you know, no one wanted pounds sterling. Everyone wanted US dollars. So essentially, some very enterprising bankers in the city of London, and this is initially entirely by accident, it was a entirely accidental trade, realised that if they were to stop using pounds sterling, stop banking with pounds sterling in London, and instead bank with US dollars, then they got to exploit simultaneously the worldwide network that was left over from British Empire and the vitality of the US dollar without any regulations at all, because, because they weren't using pounds, British regulations didn't apply. British regulations only apply to transactions in pounds. And because they weren't operating in the United States, US regulations apply. And at the time, in the immediate post-war years, there were some really quite restrictions on moving money around. You know, in, in US, US law, there was a, a limit on how much interest you could charge if you lent someone money. Um, you know, in, in Britain, there were limits on, on where you could move money around. It was quite onerous trying to operate internationally. And it was deliberately so because 
um, at the Bretton Woods Conference in New Hampshire in 1944, um, participants from all the allied nations came to the conclusion that for the stability of democracy, it was really important that speculators couldn't just fly around the world pumping up stock exchange bubbles here, you know, undermining currencies there, that, that countries needed to have the chance to economies to protect their democracies, essentially without being undermined by, you know, speculative flows and outflows of money all the time. And they're difficult for money to flow around the world. But essentially what the City of London discovered was that by moving dollars rather than pounds, they could sidestep all of those restrictions. And obviously that meant that anyone who invested via London was able to do so significantly more cheaply than they could via anywhere else because there were no rules and rules are expensive. And so people, and obviously this it, it, this became discovered very quickly, not just to British banks, but also to foreign banks. So American banks, European banks, Japanese banks, they all opened branches in the city of London just so they could take advantage of this absurdly easy to use loophole. And what that meant was speculative money could move around the world once more it could invest people could invest it wherever they wanted and they could start you know stoking stock exchange bubbles stoking inflation doing all the things that they used to be able to do in the bad old days that led you know to the great depression and the second world war which is why we ended up with a global economy that looks exactly the same as it did in you know, before or why this 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 wonderful Bretton Woods system which you know worked very well for the short period of time it lasted why it collapsed because essentially the city of London provided a loophole which allowed the the, the speculators the world's owners of capital to move money around the undermine restrictions that have been put in place by democratic governments to try and stop them doing so. So this is when the city of London became this, what I call a to the world, the servant to anyone with wealth. Because if you look at who benefited from the interventions of the city of London, from the invention of the offshore dollar market, the, the, the benefit entirely accrued to people who had wealth, because it meant that they could avoid taxes. At the time, taxes were very high, as high as 90 or percent in, in European countries at the time, you know, the, the restrictions on money were very onerous. But if you put your money via London, all of those restrictions, and all of those disappeared. Actually, that was a wonderful thing if you were rich. Uh, it sadly was less wonderful for everyone else. Right. And I, I am I'm fascinated by well, I guess I have two questions uh, uh, in one or we'll start with the first. The 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 concept of the either it's it. It was probably unknowing, but there was that colonial infrastructure still in place, right? The tentacles of colonialism still, or at the very least, the skeleton of it, despite the British Empire collapsing in the way that, you know, it was traditionally perceived, no longer a colonial empire. But those relationships and those power dynamics are still in play. And how that was exploited as a way to get a bunch of people really rich through those networks. I mean, can you can you flesh that out a bit how that was how that started um how the countries that were most susceptible to extraction also remain in the same way the most susceptible to extraction under this new capital um empire and and how that came to be uh in, in this new reinvention process of, uh for for Great Britain. Yeah, the really important point to recognise is that the capital of all of the colonies of, of the British Empire, the capital of all of the colonies of the British Empire, whether that's Australia or Tanzania or the Falkland Islands, was London. So when they became independent, and many of them became independent really quite quickly, um, you know, in, in, in a just sort of process of the beginning of the dem first demands for independence to, to independence in a decade, uh, they didn't have time to build the inf their own financial centre to build all of that. They still kept looking to London for for, final, for for bond issuances, you know, for the banks that provided finance to their companies and so on. And so those financial connections between the centre, between London and the newly independent countries, um, and obviously there were quite a lot of British people in those former colonies, people who'd lived to have been lawyers or or farmers or settlers. And, you know, they, with the best will in the world, they had absolutely no intention of having their lives dictated by foreigners, you know, because they they retained a sort of idea that they were the, you know, they didn't use the word master race because they wouldn't have been so crass, but definitely there's an aspect of, of you know, how dare these foreigners tell us what we can do. So, you know, they didn't want to keep their money in be it Tanzania or Kenya or Nigeria, they would send their money somewhere else. But at the time, 
Britain had very high taxes too. So they didn't particularly want to send their money to Britain either. And fortunately, you had all these little bits of the British Empire, which which didn't become independent. Uh, the British Virgin Islands, the Cayman Islands, mm. the Channel Islands, Jersey, Guernsey, Gibraltar, and all of these places had banks. So instead of sending that, they want to keep me in, in an ex colony, but they didn't want to put their money in Britain either. So they could put it in little bits of the British Empire, which had independent. And this becomes the capital for the growth of a banking system. Because, you know, these a British lawyer in, say, Kenya or Tanzania could say to a politician, well, if you happen to earn a little bit of extra money and you don't want to leave it in, in, in your own country, you could send it to the British Virgin Islands or the Gibraltar or Jersey or Guernsey. And this becomes the of a, a, a new form of the extractive economy, whereby it's got British people stealing the money from Kenya or Tanzania. It's local elites advised by British people who are moving the money to, to the same old places where it always used to go to. And because of, you know, there's a sort of saying that, that we let them have the government, but we kept the banks. It's a sort of, it's a sort of rather sardonic expression of how the decolonialization worked. It's because the, the economies, the form of the economies didn't really change. And the structures of the economies didn't really change. That essentially the new, the new elites, in, in almost all cases, you saw this in, in, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, in uh, India, Pakistan, in almost all cases, the ex-colonies were able to essentially repurpose the, 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 the system and the structures of empire to become a, a, a model of kleptocracy. Mm. Um, and, but also, I mean, to be honest, uh, there's just a, I mean, empire imperialism is just a nice way of saying kleptocracy, really, right? I mean, it's just a way of, of swiping money from people who, who, who have a better claim to it than you, but, but, but rigging it up in, a, in sort of a, a legal process. So really what's happening is, is, is a continuation of the British Empire by other, other um, words. And, but because of the, the, the sort of vitality and the ease of extracting wealth in huge quantities via these sort of kleptocratic networks, it, it's no longer confined to the old speaking colonies and it's much more widely. You know, it's obviously places like Russia and the former Soviet Union into China, into America and so on. So it's, it is no longer confined by just the English speaking countries, the former Soviet Union. But you see, um, you, you do see a, a smaller version of this phenomenon in France with, with its former colonies who, 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 who now look, who look to France to move their money. So in a way, you know, though Britain is kind of butler to the world, France does this to a smaller extent and Portugal does it to an even smaller extent with their former colonies. You see the same networks persist between the old colonies and, and, and the colonizing country. Well, it, it, it's easy because those networks, as you say, um, continue uh, to, to exist and you can just, you know, um, utilize o old old networks to that degree, even though obviously it still it remains um, vibrant. It's kind of just like a modernizing of uh, colonialism, except it, it, the the dynamic that you just that you explore, which is really the invention of offshoring your money to avoid taxation restrictions. You mentioned the Cayman Islands, et cetera. Um, can you talk, explain further the 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 role of those tax havens um within the international stage and how really um the the great britain and its tax havens helped unshackle capitalism post uh the great depression on the international stage because there still were in the united states more restrictions more of a commitment uh not just in the u.s in Western uh, in in the West, a commitment to a more Keynesian economic model, and with the w with these new pathways towards extraction and capital, um, it, it 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 these tax havens play a significant role. I mean, it's an absolutely crucial point. I mean, obviously, for obvious reasons, when we talk about this, uh, but then we we focus on kleptocrats and oligarchs because that's the most egregious expression of how. This offshore world. If it were only a question of kleptocrats and oligarchs, it, it would be easily solved, right? They don't have a very powerful lobby in Western countries, and those loopholes could be closed quite quickly. What's really important, as, as you as you said, is that the the first tax haven islands, the British Virgin Islands, Bermuda, um, those first British tax havens, um, when that was British, is that they were 
used, first of all, not by kleptocrats, not by mafiosi, but were used, first of all, by American corporations um, who were ways to minimize uh, their taxes, their need to comply with the regulations of the New Deal state, which were, you know, by, by modern standards, extremely onerous in terms of what they required them to do. They had to pay large amounts of taxes and so on. And they wanted to find ways of, of dodging those taxes. And they discovered, you know, via very entrepreneurial and imaginative lawyers who kept scanning around looking for ways of doing this, they discovered that by rooting their money uh, via companies or structures registered in these tiny British colonies in the Caribbean, they were essentially able to take advantage of treaties that dated back decades that allowed them to cut their taxes to, to incredibly low rates. And they didn't just, it, it, this isn't just a passive process. Um, these lawyers would, in the case of the British Virgin Islands in particular, would, would, would participate in the legislative process in the British Virgin Islands. So a New York lawyer and the attorney general of the local government um, would be participating to write legislation between them, you know, send legislation back and forth. It was perfectly crafted for the attorneys of the New York lawyers to make sure that as widely and as expeditiously as possible. So the, the capital flow that we now see the huge tech companies doing in particular, sort of, we, we've heard a lot of Apple moving money via uh, in Jersey. Um, uh, Starbucks has been notorious for it. Um, uh, Google and so on. I mean, these companies that make do companies that huge business overseas, you know, who who like to park their profits in in offshore centers to pay taxes on them. Um, the trail was blazed for those tech companies back in the 1960s and 70s. Hearing companies realized that they could move their money via these at the time very little known jurisdictions in the Caribbean and essentially taxes and i mean there is an argument we made, it's an argument that i think is 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 you know has a lot of foundation that essentially globalization is, is really optionalization really the the movement of money via globalized financial systems is really to money via tax havens because you know if you look at how the money and profits are shifted it's it's amazing how the profits end up in the places with the, with no taxes you know well, they're, they're, even yeah. though they do no business there well, they're both um, both the, the dynamic that you described. I'm saying dynamic a lot today, but both the 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 um, concept that you describe and the trade deals associated with globalization are all meant to circumvent sovereignty um, and and pick and choose for these companies or for these wealthy individuals what regulations they want which are usually you know they want to go towards the ones with the least amount um they want to abide by and so i mean i don't think it's a coincidence that in the 90s we see these free trade deals and the loosening of um of of restrictions on international trade at, at the same time that these tax havens really explode and become uh necessary and common not just commonplace but pretty much every wealthy person and every corporation is engaging in many of these practices at this point yeah i mean the big corporations they love being american in when it comes to protection of intellectual property um or you know if there's an international practice and they need a bit of defense they love it then they become super but mysteriously they're significantly less patriotic when it comes to where they book their profits for tax purposes or, or, you know, like you say, when the ghost deals and so on. And the joy of globalization, if you are rich to, to take advantage of it, is you choose which bits of which laws you follow. You can say, I'm American for intellectual property purposes. I'm American trade war between the US and China. But when it comes to paying taxes, I'm from Bermuda today, or if that loophole's closed, I'll be from Jersey tomorrow. Or I'll be from Ireland. And yet that will be structured in such a way that though I'm domiciled in Ireland, mysteriously for tax purposes, I'm not anywhere. Um, so that system, that offshore system, whereby anyone or any company that is sufficiently wealthy to hire the right advisors and to, and to structure their assets internationally, that they are able to, to, to pick and choose which jurisdictions um, they, they follow the rules of. That is the offshore system that the City of London gave birth to in the 1950s with those pioneering dollar trades, dollar denominated trades in London is the first manifestation of offshore. And it's really interesting if you look at why it's called offshore, because they needed a term, a legal concept for what was happening. And they turned to maritime law 
because you know what do you call it if you are out of reach of any country jurisdiction that's if you're out and there's no law that's because you're you're out on the high seas so essentially the what they thought of they they, they turned to almost to um, from piracy from, from the pirates in the in the caribbean was to say well if if we're out of the reach of marath only earthly jurisdiction then we're offshore it's really interesting how again that turns back to the british empire because that's a british legal term that they may repurpose to use to describe financial transactions and it you know it, it just keeps going back to the legacy of of the financial structures of the british empire which were, were repurposed by some very skilled and imaginative lawyers and financiers to serve the needs of this new globalized economy and and also what is um disturbing and frustrating about how some uh times corruption is described on the uh, international stage is that the countries that were most extracted during colonialism and uh the countries that don't have you know um the the infrastructure in place to be deemed a player and the uh, the amount of money uh, on on the international stage they're designated as the most corrupt countries in the world where um the the that that's not necessarily true right it's like blaming um you know uh the it's it's flattening a power dynamic and blaming countries that don't have mechanisms to hide their corruption or to naturalize their corruption as the most corrupt poorer countries where these systems of corruption in britain or in the united states um are not necessarily uh, uh designated as such can you talk a bit about that yeah i couldn't agree more it's a little bit the way we discuss corruption is a little bit like talking opioid crisis and the users of opioids family for or, or, or Purdue Pharma for having created OxyContin in the first place. Um, there is a um, a really alarming way that we have defined corruption as some as the bit of corruption that happens in foreign countries where where to be honest, let's be honest, black and brown people live. Um, that's where corruption happens, and what happens in our countries that corruption. But it, it, it's an incredibly self serving definition and it goes i mean obviously it's it's you see it in reports by um ngos like transparency international but it actually goes far further than that when the the financial action task force that sets international rules around money laundering um you know they will you know uh blacklist or gray list countries which aren't compliant but the way that they do it is you know and this has been demonstrated by uh you know academics from the central bank of the bahamas is is, is essentially indistinguishable Racism. If if it was explained by racism, then the, the the same results would be what you'd end up with. So yeah, it is. There is a, a total misunderstanding about how corruption works, about the complicity of international financial centres in corruption, about the fact that you know oligarchs wouldn't be corrupt without enablers, and and our failure to talk about that means that we can't tackle the problem because we are failing to diagnose a disease. And you, if you don't diagnose it. You can't cure it. So it's really what I try and do with my books is to is to try and explain what corruption actually is to look at every stage of the transaction, not just the the, the bribe that is being taken, but also how the bribe is being given. And lastly, you know, I, I didn't really get too much into some of the specific examples that you give in your book, but there are a lot of great ones and I'm sure you could have come up with many more. Um, but you know, you you visited the British Virgin Islands and you spoke with uh, government officials there. In terms of their response, I mean, how would you characterize it? Was it is everybody getting rich, or do they? You know, is there any understanding of the role that's played there? I, I mean, I, I'm just curious what your what your take is on it. It's it's really difficult um, for them to to address what they're doing because in the 70s which is when the offshore economy began there the british virgin islands were ludicrously poor like incredibly poor subsistence agriculture level poor um they had been neglected by the british state which though technically a colony for, for 150 200 forever really and they discovered their ability to earn money from selling shell companies and and so they went ahead with it no one tried to stop them there was no you know 
pushback from London, by all means, carry on, sell shell companies, was more or less the response. Um, and so now they have a relatively good standard of living. I mean, it is a you know an unequal society, but generally speaking, compared to how it was, um, you know, people are well off. People have cars. People have good houses. Have supermarkets and so on. It's you know, it it is a a, a profitable, a prosperous looking Caribbean jurisdiction um, by the standards of all the other places I've been to. Um, but it does its prosperity is based essentially on stealing money from other people or, or or stealing tax revenue from other people and that is a difficult thing to confront and there is a certain amount of realization of it but also uh it that's coupled with a with a sort of what else are we supposed to do you know we need to make a living and that is part of the problem in in, in microcosm that that the uk has in that the uk so its prosperity is to a large extent based on moving other people's money around so as not to pay taxes. Um, and challenged, you know, people say, well, well, if we don't do this, where's the taxes going to come from to build the schools and the roads and the hospitals? Um, and, and that's a challenge that many politicians here just refuse because they don't want to have to, you know, build a new way of, of, of making an economy, an, an economy that isn't extracting well, need it far more than we do. Um, because th that would be, let's face it, it would be quite difficult. Well, uh, can't thank you enough uh, for your time today. Oliver uh, Below, author of Butler to the World, How Britain Became the Servant of Tycoons, Tax Dodgers, Kleptocrats, and Criminals. We will put a link uh, to your book uh, in the description on the podcast and on YouTube, etc. Thank you so much, uh, Oliver, for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. Of course. With that, we are going to wrap up the first hour of this program. Uh, we're going to head into the fun half. We don't know what's happening on Left Reckoning. Matt is still out. He should be back Wednesday or Thursday. Forget. He'll be back Wednesday, yep. Wednesday? Mm -hmm. You're not talking into the mic. Oh, sorry. There you are. He will be, he will be back Wednesday. Ah, yeah. hi, Bradley. That's me. That's Bradley. Um, we'll be taking your calls in the fun half, 646-257-3920, uh, but check out Left Reckoning, check out Scam Economy, uh, Matt Binders, Doomed, The Discourse, all of our friends at the Majority Report. Um, so yeah, we'll be definitely be taking your calls. We got, we're going to get to some cliffs. Jordan Peterson, deserving of mockery on a daily basis, um, and more. See you in the fun half. Three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now, and I don't think it's going to be the same as it looks like in six months from now, and I don't know if it's necessarily going to be better six months from now than it is three months from now, but I think around 18 months out, we're going to look back and go like, wow. What? What is that going on? It's nuts. Wait a second. Hold on. For, hold on for a second. The Emma, welcome to the program. Hey. Fun hack. Matt. Who? Fun hack. What is up, everyone? Fun hack. No me key. You did it. Fun hack. Let's Point go, there. Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. Fun hack. Bradley, you want to say hello? Uh, sorry to disappoint you. Everyone, I'm just a random guy. It's all the boys today. Fundamentally false. No, I'm sorry. Women. Stop. Talking oh, for wow. a second. Now let me finish. Where is this coming from, dude? But, but dude, uh, you want to smoke this? Uh, seven eight. Yes. Hi, me. This thing. Yes. Uh, is this me? Is it me? It is you. Is this me? Hello, is this me? I think it is you. Who is you? No sound. Every single freaking day. What's on your mind? Sports. We can discuss free markets and we can discuss capitalism. Oh, I'm going to go start right. Ooh, libertarian. They're so stupid, though. Common sense says, of course. Gobbledygook. We fucking nailed him. So what's 79 plus 21? Challenge man. I'm positively quivering. I believe 96, I want to say. 857. 210. 35. 501. One half. 38. 9-11, for instance. $3,400. $1,900. $6, $5, $4, 3000000000000 trillion sold. It's a zero-sum game. Actually, you're making me think less. But, but let me say this. Poop. <laughs> you call it satire. Sam goes to satire. On top of it all, yeah. my favorite part about yeah. you is just like every day, all day, like yeah. every day.
me do it. Without a doubt. Hey, buddy, we see you. <laughs> All right, folks, folks, folks. It's just the week being weeded out, obviously. Yeah, sun's out, guns out. I, I, I don't know. But you should know. The, People the, just don't like to entertain ideas anymore. I have a question. Who cares? Our chat is enabled, wow. folks. Love it. I do love that. Uh, uh, this, this, Look, um, gotta jump. You gotta be quick. I gotta jump. I'm losing it, bro. <laughs> um, Two o'clock. We're already late, and the guy's being a dick. So screw him. Um, um, Sent to a gulag? Outrageous. Like, what is wrong with you? Love you. Bye. Love you. Bye bye. <laughs>